the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Friday, everyone! It's April Fool's Day, or maybe it's Valentine's Day. As you can see, the hearts are swirling around my head because I am lovestruck. Uh, now, if I can only figure out how to stop those, uh, you know, we'll figure that out. But uh, anyway, I've got the hearts swirling around my head today. It has been the craziest day. Uh, first of all, uh, my guest uh, that was supposed to be here today, uh, Quinn Lemley, uh, is celebrating her birthday in St. Martin. Now, uh, no fooling. That's where she is. Uh, so I get an email today from her uh, that she unfortunately could not be here today because of technical issues between here and St. Martin. So she is not going to be here today. And she was actually going to be appearing here. Those of you who know Quinn Lemley knows that she appears as uh, Rita Hayworth. Uh, and I was going to do a special holiday show. Uh, now I've got to get rid of these hearts. How does that happen? Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if I can figure this all out. Uh, stop the hearts. Let's stop that. I hope that I can stop it. Uh, anyway, I don't know how to stop these hearts. They started and now I don't know how to stop. Stop. Anyway, I hope these hearts don't drive you crazy. Uh, we'll figure, let's uh, maybe normal. There they go. They're gone. The hearts are gone. So anyway, Quinn Limley uh, was, is not able to be here today. So uh, it's just you and me. Uh, if any of you want to come on and talk about anything that's on your mind, uh, please come on and join me today. Uh, I am going to put the uh, invitation on screen. And all you need to do is just copy and paste this link, send it to me. You can come on and we'll talk about anything that's on your mind. Uh, the word for the day is generosity. And generosity, uh, generosity of spirit generosity of giving, whether you give to yourself or you give to others, uh, whatever it is that you give. But I thought today that what I would do, uh, since she is not here, is that I would make this about you. Uh, I would make this about me, and I would make this about the show. So anything that any of you want to talk about, it can be about this is the wrap up the week. And boy, have we been through a week. The Oscars uh, last Sunday night, uh, so much was going on with that. And people everywhere are talking about uh, what they saw in the Oscars, what they didn't see on the Oscars. Uh, and what they didn't see on the Oscars uh, are so many stars uh, that are no longer with us uh, that we lost in the past year. Jane Withers. Carlton Carpenter, Arlene Dahl, uh, just three that pop in off the top of my head. These are people who have entertained us our entire lives. And so what has ended up happening is that when we get to the in memoriam uh, section of the Oscars, uh, the powers that be, whomever they happen to be these days, feel that the people who are watching at home uh, are not going to be entertained uh, by just sitting back and watching their names scroll over the screen. I beg to differ. These people have been entertaining us our entire lives. There's a reason why TCM is still a very popular channel. There's a reason why before we had all of these various channels that people... Uh, went to video stores and bought these old movies. Uh, hello, Doug McAllister. Thank you for being here. Um, 
people are interested in who these people are. A few years ago, uh, it was they were giving uh, Tommy Toon a Lifetime Achievement Award. And it was decided, uh, again, by the powers that be, that Tommy's Lifetime Achievement Award would be given to him prior to the broadcast. And once I got word of this, Tommy's a friend, uh, I started a campaign within the theater community. And thank God everyone listened. Petitions were signed. There was, uh, it was picked up by uh, Broadway World, Theater Mania broad, uh, picked it up, and they ended up giving him the award during the broadcast. We have these silly segments that people uh, are putting onto the Oscar uh, ceremonies uh, that take away from what the evening is about. And I think that we need to get back to what the real purpose of these award ceremonies, I think, were originally meant to be, and that was to honor, to celebrate. And if we go back to that original intent, I think that we will get back to honoring and celebrating these great artists as they were meant to be celebrated. And give us the in memoriam section, make it a little longer. They decided this year that they were going to take away opening the envelope for certain categories. And we still went over another half hour. And then there are the special, the Governor's Award, uh, the Gene Herschel Award. Uh, those special awards uh, were also given out on another night. And even though Samuel L. Jackson and Lee Ullman were at the Oscar ceremony, um, they were basically given short shrift uh, while Amy Schumer, who I love, uh, was given a routine about uh, seat fillers. And that's gotten a controversy. Uh, so I'd like to hear your comments. I'd like to hear what your questions are. Um, if you have any thoughts, good, bad, indifferent, put them on the screen here, and I will try to address those. Um, uh, and Pico says, I love the short film that Tommy Toon and Mar Champion did with a song about wanting to be a movie star. Um, uh, I Was that part of this year? Um, I don't think I saw that. Um, if it was, uh, I don't think I saw it. Uh, maybe you're talking about something uh, from another time that I'm confusing with this. Uh, but again, yes, we need to get back to celebrating what Hollywood was about. We on, um, they honored The Godfather and Al Pacino and, uh, and Robert De Niro uh, are walked out on stage and neither one of them say a word about the film. What was that about? Was that a choice that they, they both made? Was it not? Who knows? But the fact was that here are these iconic, uh, okay, I don't know anything about that. So, uh, you know, maybe you can give us a link or something and we can, you know, talk about that. But here were these iconic actors. Then they honored The Godfather. And The Godfather uh, was honored but they interspersed that with music that had nothing to do with The Godfather. Uh, they did the same thing uh, with uh, their tribute to uh, James Bond. Uh, there was music that was brought in that had nothing to do with James Bond. Who are these people that are making these decisions in Hollywood? I personally don't think that they are movie people. I don't think that these are people who have a reverence or a respect for what Hollywood was. Uh, we have to respect where we've been uh, to respect where we are and where we're going. And I don't think that, you know, it's taking away from the filmmakers of today for us to acknowledge where we've been. Uh, Doug McAllister says, I wanna see more about the stars, not the presenters. 
That is why we are tuning in. I agree with you. Um, I uh, uh, Tasha says that she agrees with all that I'm saying, and I appreciate that. I do think that we need to celebrate, um, you know, the past, the present, and the future. Uh, those of you who know me know that I've spoken the, in the past about uh, Florence Epps. I'm going to show her picture here. Uh, I hope that you can see it uh, without uh, too much of a glare. Uh, this is Florence Epps sitting down. Uh, she was my mentor. Uh, I'll tell you the story about Florence Epps. Uh, Florence Epps, uh, Florence Theodora Epps uh, from my hometown of Conway, South Carolina. She was legendary in my hometown. Uh, Florence Epps was the first woman in my hometown uh, to have her hair bobbed in the 1920s. Uh, she left home, well, uh, before she left home, uh, she ordered her husband uh, in a mail order catalog. Uh, she was out of town when he arrived and her sister met him when he arrived and her sister who lived in the house next door uh, married him. Uh, and uh, so her uh, Florence Epps and her sister, although they lived in houses next door to each other, never spoke to each other again. Florence Epps leaves. She goes to Winthrop College in South Carolina, which at that time was an all-girls school. And she uh, studies theater, uh, and she comes to New York, and she goes to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and she studies with Spencer Tracy. And she leaves there, and she goes, takes a train, she goes out west, and she goes to the Pasadena Playhouse, and she is in a class with James Stewart and uh, with uh, James Stewart and uh, Spencer Tracy. And she is offered a film contract at both Paramount Studios at MGM. But she decides that rather than having a film career, that she wants to go back to my hometown of Conway, South Carolina, and she wants to bring theater to our hometown. So she goes back to South Carolina and she teaches there. In 1969, she uh, incorporates the Theater of the Republic, uh, which was the theater where I got my debut. The theater opened with their first production, which was Finian's Rainbow in 1969. And in 1974, I auditioned for my first show. Uh, I talk about this in my one-man show, and since I'm here today and no one else is joining me, and some of you know this story, I will share this story from my show. Um, I auditioned, uh, well, I got wind that they were holding auditions for MAME. Now, to tell you a little bit about myself, I grew up on a tobacco farm in South Carolina, and uh, I am a product of 1960s and 70s television. Uh, I wanted to live in the world of the variety show. Uh, Ed Sullivan, Merv Griffin, those were my idols. They still are. Uh, that's why I do what I do. I wanted to be a part of that world. A world in Carol Burnett on Saturday nights. That was a world that truly did not really exist. Uh, I don't think it ever existed uh, beyond the parameters of those shows. Uh, it truly didn't exist uh, by the time that I arrived in New York uh, several years later, which I'll get to in a few moments. But I wanted to be a part of that world so much that I used to put on shows on our front porch uh, in South Carolina uh, I used to perform on the front steps of Conway High School. Uh, I would perform any opportunity that I could perform for anyone, just as I'm doing for all of you right now, for anyone that would take the time to be there for me. I would get up and I would perform. And so I found out that they were holding auditions for MAME. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't know MAME from Maine. Uh, but 
I heard that there was a part for a young boy in the show. So I went to the auditions at the Theater of the Republic, Main Street Auditorium, Conway, South Carolina. So I show up at the auditions, I go in and Miss Epps and was there and I knew of her from school. Uh, I knew about her little playhouse in her backyard, but I went there and I went to the auditions and I sat there waiting to go in and then they asked me to go up on stage and they asked me what I prepared. And of course I had nothing prepared because I had never auditioned for anything in my life. But I got up on stage and they asked me what I was going to sing. And I had nothing. I had no music, nothing. They said, well, this is a musical. Well, I knew that the Conway Library had a music section. And one of my favorite shows that was shown repeatedly was Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. This was the Leslie Ann Warren version. Uh, Leslie Ann Warren, much later, would become a friend of mine, uh, I'm proud to say. But I, I, I ran to the library, I got the music, and I came in, and I gave uh, probably what was the worst audition that they had ever encountered. But I got up, I sang, I finished the song, and they said, we'll be in touch. But when they said, we'll be in touch, I truly believed that they would truly be in touch. Now, remember, this is 1974. This was in a time where we didn't have cell phones. We had one telephone in our home. And that telephone that was in our home hung on the wall in our kitchen. And it was one telephone without uh, call waiting, uh, without uh, an answering machine. Uh, so I would not allow anyone in my family to use the telephone for almost two weeks while I sat by the phone waiting for that phone call to come in. That phone call that, as you can believe, never came. I waited and I waited and I waited. And then one day I was at school and I found out through the grapevine that the first night of rehearsals were taking place at the auditorium for MAME. So I thought that obviously Joe Greer, the director, had lost my number. So I showed up anyway at the theater so you can imagine the surprise when Joe Greer stepped out of his car, his Volkswagen Beetle, and he sees me sitting on the steps of Conway High School, uh, of Conway uh, Main Street Auditorium, waiting for him to arrive. So he said, Ricky, as they all called me, Ricky, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I heard that the night was the first night of rehearsals. I figured that you probably lost my number. And he said, there's nothing in the show for you. But since you're here, you know, why don't you hang out anyway? So that was enough for me. I went, I sat there, but I was excited to be in the theater. I was excited as I watched the people come in and I sat there, tears filling up in my eyes. Tears are going to fill up in my eyes now as I think about this. I was excited watching adults, not kids, adults, get parts in this show and the excitement that they were all filling as they were finding out what roles they were going to be playing in this production. And as they were handing out these roles, uh, there was a walk-on part of a messenger with two lines. Uh, the lines were, uh, this messenger comes in and Agnes Gooch says, oh my, oh my, I've been here two weeks and already we've had two cocktail parties. He says, sign here. Only 13? She says, only, and he says, yes, 13. And he says, again, sign here. And someone said, why don't you give Ricky that part? And he said, Ricky, do you want this part? And I said, yes. I jumped up as if they had given me the role of Patrick Dennis. And I took that part and I worked on those two lines as if I had the lead role in that show. And I worked on those lines over and over and over again. 
And I showed up at every rehearsal. I was eager, hoping that that night they would work on that one moment in the show uh, after the big production number of It's Today so that I could do that moment of me walking on stage. And little by little, they started putting me in the other production numbers and everything. And I ended up getting more than just that, just those two lines. So after the show closed, um, it was a couple of years uh, before anything else came along. And the next show that they did that I found out that there was a part in for me or that I thought there was a part was the unsinkable Molly Brown. So I went to the audition and I auditioned for one of the brothers and I didn't get it, but I was cast. I was cast to play Roberts, the butler. And when I got this part and it was a real honest to God role with honest to God lines and it was a bigger part than just those two lines. And I remember going to Linda Simmons, the director, and I said, why did you give me this role? And she said, anybody who had worked that hard on those two lines deserved a chance. And on opening night of the show, Florence Epps, once again, for those who are just getting here, Florence Epps, there she is. Florence Epps came backstage and she handed me an apple. And she asked me if I knew the story of the Barrymore apples. And of course I didn't. And she told me to go to the library and get the book about the royal family of Broadway, the Barrymores. And once I knew about the apple to give her a call, and so I called her up as soon as I found out. You see, when Ethel Barrymore opened on Broadway, her brothers gave her a basket of apples because if the show was a flop, at least she wouldn't starve to death. And that started a tradition with the Barrymore apples. And so every night on opening night, the Barrymores would uh, give apples to each other. And those of you who remember uh, going to Barrymore's, there was an apple on the door and that was the tradition of Barrymore's. And the Barrymore Award is an apple. So Miss Epps gave me this apple because she believed that I had the potential uh, to go into the theater. And she said that she believed that I had the makings of being an actor if I could get rid of that accent that I had. You see, I had an accent that you could cut with a knife. And she said that if I could cut, if I could get rid of the accent, she believed that I could go on to other roles and uh, have a chance in the theater. But you have to understand, I come from a background. Uh, my father was a welder. Uh, my mom was a housemaker. Uh, and my mom worked in a factory. And I'm the oldest of four kids. And I grew up on a farm. And the idea of me going to Miss Epps' house on uh, Wednesday and Thursday afternoons for acting and elocution lessons uh, is something that was just not going to happen with my family. And I was embarrassed to tell Miss Epps that. And, uh, but I told her that my parents would not go for it. Um, my parents never really did support the idea that I would go into the theater. And even when I came to New York at the age of 18, my parents said that this would be something that I would have to do on my own, that they would never support that decision. And I don't say this for anyone to feel sorry for my parents or to dislike my parents because it was just a world that they did not understand. And I have no hard feelings against my parents for that. But Miss Epps said, we'll figure something out. So what I would do is I would go to Miss Epps' home. She had a playhouse in her backyard. And I would go to her home on Wednesday and Thursday afternoons. And I would uh, rake leaves. No leaf blowers in those days, folks. I would rake leaves. I would go to the supermarket. I would clean windows. I would clean out the gutters. I would do whatever I could for a couple of hours. And then we would go, we would have tea and we would read from the classics 
and we would learn about these great artists. I tell this story because as we would read these books and we would talk about these great artists that went before me, the Barrymores, and Florence Epps was friends with the Gish sisters who would come and visit her. I never met them, but they would come and visit her. Um, I did meet, uh, you know, Edward Everett Horton would come and visit her. Um, and, uh, you know, all these great stars. And uh, I would see the letters that she would correspond with them and everything. Uh, she kept this relationship with these great people and she would ask me about them. And if I didn't know who they were, or if I was reading a book or if I was reading about someone that I didn't know about, she would close the book and she would say, okay, now go to the library, learn about these people and I will see you here next week. And I would leave the library, and I mean, leave her playhouse. I would go to the library and I would get, get uh, go to the one section of theater books and I would go into the index of all these books and I would go through the index and I would look up the names of all of the people um, that she would mention in these letters and everything. And I would read everything I could about these people because she instilled in me that every time I step on stage and I feel this every time I sit in this chair to do what I do every single day, that I am carrying on my shoulders the mantle of every single person that has ever gone before me, that this is what I do it for, that I am honoring them, that I'm honoring you, that it behooves me to know who they are and to celebrate them. That's why I call what I do Richard Skipper Celebrates. And she says, it's very important that I go on to celebrate these people. That comes from Florence Epps. She instilled that in me. I would also, on Saturday mornings, my parents would drop me off at the library. And the first thing that I would do would get the New York Times from the preceding week and I would go and look at the Sunday section of the New York Times and go to the Hirschfeld. And I would count the Ninas because I knew about that. And I would find out about all the shows that were coming to New York. And all I would think about was coming to New York. And I was reading a book when I was, uh, and again, this is, I wrote a, a show uh, called The Magic of Believing uh, because when I was, 13 years old, um, I'm reading this book called The Magic of Believing by Claude M. Bristol. Uh, those of you who know me know this story. Uh, true story, if my mom's watching, she will tell this is a true story. Tells you the kind of kid that I was, I'm reading this book called The Magic of Believing by Claude M. Bristol. And in the book, uh, Mr. Bristol says, set your mind on an image like a homing pigeon and go after it with dogged determination. And I'm reading this book on July 13th, 1974. And I closed the book and I went in and I said to my mom and my dad, five years from today, I'm going to New York. And my mom and dad, they laughed at me. And they said, sure you are, sure you are. And I said, watch me. And so every year uh, I would have a calendar and I would tick off that five, four years from today, I'm going to New York. Three years from today, I'm going to New York. Two years from today, I'm going, and I kept doing that. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know that it was gonna happen, but my mind was made up that I was going to come to New York on July 5th, 1979. And on Christmas of 1978, um, at Christmas uh, parade in Conway, South Carolina, I run into my uh, uh, third grade teacher, Diane Ray, who I just discovered on Facebook. Diane Ray, my third grade teacher, I run into her and she says, Ricky, I, you're gonna be graduating from high school. 
what are you going to do when you graduate from high school? And I said, I'm going to New York. And she said, well, do you know anyone in New York? And I said, no. She said, well, you know, David Johnson lives in New York. Now, David Johnson, strangely enough, interestingly enough, had done the lighting design for the unsinkable Molly Brown with the Theater of the Republic. His father was the superintendent of the school board. So I called his father and I said that I wanted to get in touch with David because I was going to be moving to New York and I wanted to get in touch with him. So I reached out to, uh, uh, he gave me David's address and I wrote David a letter about uh, telling him that I was going to be moving to New York on August 5th of 79. Uh, and I waited and I waited and I waited for that letter, like waiting for the phone call. I never got a response. That should have been clue number one. Uh, I didn't get a response. My birthday is February 11th. Uh, so on February 11th of, uh, you know, uh, 1979, uh, I decided to call David. So I called David's father and I, then I called, uh, and I got his number and I called David and David said, I'm so glad you called. I lost your number. Now in my letter, I have to tell you all this. So in the letter I had written to David and I said, I want to know, true story, where the nearest YMCA is. Because I had heard that when young men went to New York, they stayed at the YMCA. So David said, why don't you stay with me? Because I have my own business and I have my own apartment. So I said, um, that's wonderful. I got off the phone with him. I told my parents that I finally have a place to stay in New York and that I, I was on my way. So. But my parents, even then, did not believe that I would follow through with this. So then it was no longer a matter of four years, I'm going to New York, three years. It was a matter of counting off the months. So I started saving the money to come to New York. And so then in June, um, I knew that the month, you know, the time was ticking away and I needed to get... Uh, a, a ticket to New York. So I called P I called the airline board, which was actually the air force base in Myrtle beach, South Carolina. Conway is outside of Myrtle beach. So I called the air force base and I wanted to know how I could get a ticket to Myrtle beach, uh, to New York. And I didn't have a credit card in those days. Um, and a one way ticket to New York, uh, was $86 and lose change. Uh, it was actually $86 and 76 cents. So I called, uh, so I went to my parents and I had saved up enough money. I had, I had enough money to get a ticket. So I said to my dad, would you take me to the airport so I can get a ticket? My dad said to me, we're not playing this game with you. If you wanna go to the airport, you're on your own. So I went outside to hitchhike to the airport because the, the airport was about 15, 20 miles away from where our house was. And I went out again, 1979, I'm 18 years old. I hitchhike, within seconds, a car pulls up. This woman rolls the window down. <laughs> she said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to the Air Force Base. Um, uh, and she said, hop in. And she takes me to the Air Force Base. I go in, I buy a one-way ticket to New York and I hitchhiked my way back home. And I came in and I had this one-way ticket to New York and I was so excited and I was on my way to New York. So the day that I was scheduled to come to New York, um, I had packed everything up. I was coming to New York and I went in, I was so excited. I called David that morning and I told, uh, and I, I, I said, you know, I will be arriving around two o'clock this afternoon. And he said, I am so sorry. I'm not going to be able to pick you up at the airport. Uh, just take, a, lim uh, take an, uh, a cab to my apartment. The apartment was at 86th Street and 2nd Avenue. We had, because of our close proximity to Myrtle Beach, 
we had these summer neighbors and he was a cab driver from Washington, D.C. They would come in the summer. Uh, Miss Marion, uh, another wonderful story. She introduced me to so many Broadway musicals. She would come in in the summer with, she introduced me to a chorus line and Fiddler on the Roof and Hello Dolly and all these great albums. We would sit and drink iced tea and listen to these cast albums. So anyway, um, they were up in arms. They said, you're going to come into New York. You're going to step off of the airplane. They're going to, this, a cab driver is going to feel like you fell off the turnip truck and you are going to be lost in New York. It's going to cost you a fortune. Um, believe it or not, I only had $500 to come to New York with. And they knew this. And they were afraid that I would come to New York. And that first day that I was in New York, that all of my money would be gone like that. So they suggested that I take an airport limousine. Now, what they were referring to was um, a shuttle bus uh, from uh, LaGuardia Airport uh, to uh, Midtown Manhattan uh, to get me to 86th Street and 2nd Avenue. I had never been anywhere in my life. I had never been outside the parameters of my hometown. I had never flown before. I had never slept in another bed except when I stayed at my grandparents' home. I had never been anywhere. I did not know the first thing about where I was going or anything. So I I remember the morning that we left, you know, my family, we went out for that last meal that I went out with my family. My mom's crying. They couldn't believe that I was going through with this. My father was very stoic. My father said, you'll be back in three weeks. He was convinced of that. And I was like, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. I didn't know what was ahead of me, but I was on my way. So the last thing I remember is last call for LaGuardia Airport. And I was like a bat out of hell. I get on the plane. I get on the plane. And the minute I get on the plane, I burst into tears. Because as this still exterior that I had been carrying around for all this time, um, for the first time, I allowed myself to really feel what I was feeling. So I get on the plane and I burst into tears. I was scared to death. And I'm sitting next to this couple. It was a French couple. And they said, oh, is this your first flight? And I lied and said, no, I fly all the time. And of course they knew the difference. And uh, they said, what is your name? And I said, Richard. And it was the first time that I introduced myself as Richard because I'd always been Ricky for 18 years. I was Ricky Skipper. And for the first time I was Richard Skipper. And it was like I was a new person all of a sudden. So I arrive in New York, I get off the plane, I get my luggage and all I see is a sign that says limousine. And I go and I get in line and I hire a black stretch limousine, $60. So I arrived my first day in New York City in a black stretch limousine. And we pull up to the apartment, 86th Street and Le uh, 86 and Lexington, uh, 2nd Avenue, I mean, 86 and 2nd Avenue. And it was a five story walk up apartment. So we go up to the apartment, David Johnson meets me. He comes down the stairs and we go upstairs and it was almost as if I had walked into an opium den. The entire room is, it, it, it smelled uh, of pot and a, a, a smell that, by the way, I had never smelled before. And uh, we go up, he was as high as a kite. And he said, asked me if I wanted any, which of course I didn't. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to uh, go for a walk. And he wanted to show me the sights and sounds of New York. So we go into Central Park. Uh, we go to Central Park. And the first place he takes me is the Rambles. So for those of you who don't know what the Rambles were like in 1979, go and look it up. Um, it was very different from what it is now. And then he takes me to Bethesda Fountain and he makes a deal, if you know what I'm talking about. 
And then uh, we go back to the apartment and he packs his uh, shoulder bag and he says he's staying with a friend for the night and that I will be meeting his roommates, Brad and Lisa, the next morning. Now, at no point during any of our conversations or anything has he ever mentioned Brad and Lisa. And I said, well, who were Brad and Lisa? And he said, well, they're my roommates. And I said, do they know anything about me? And he said, well, they'll meet you tomorrow morning. They're going to love you. And he said, um, you've got the place to yourself tonight. And with that, he left. And here I am, 18 years old, on my own, in a city that I've never been to in my life, alone in an apartment. Um, I didn't know how to even order food. And if I did order food, I didn't know how to tell them how to get to where I was. I was afraid to leave the apartment for fear that I would be mugged or beaten to death. Uh, again, this was 1979. I had heard all kinds of stories about what happened in New York after dark. So I was afraid to leave. I was on my own. There was nothing in the refrigerator except for a carafe of water, um, half a loaf of wheat bread, and a half a jar of honey. I had not eaten. I'm alone. I cried myself to sleep my first night in New York City. So this is a railroad flat. So the next morning I wake up, I'm excited to be in New York City. I decide that I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna start my first full day in New York City. I get up, I go to go to the bathroom. I walk through the railroad flat. I walk through what is or was, is, are, is Brad and Lisa's uh, bedroom. And there they are doing what comes naturally. And Lisa looks up at me and she goes, who the F are you? And he says, well, hello there. Here I have this 18 year old kid in New York City with saucers for eyes. Uh, I go, I am uh, Brad's new roommate. And she says, over my dead body. First day in New York City. So I go into the bathroom. I shut the door and I am shaking like a leaf. I am like petrified of what is happening to me. My first day in New York City. And I am in there again, like I am I'm convulsing literally because here I am not knowing what my next move is going to be, where I'm going to go, what's going to happen to me. And Brad comes and knocks on the door. He says, why don't you come out and talk with us? So they had pulled themselves together. I had pulled myself together. I came out and uh, uh, introduced myself at this point. And uh, they, uh, and I told them who I was and that Brad, uh, that uh, David had told me uh, that I could live there. And uh, they said, well, this is not our apartment. This is a sublet. And uh, I didn't even know what a sublet was. So I said, well, David said that I could work with him. And Lisa lets out like a cackle of a laugh. She said, he's a temp. So everything that David had said to me was a lie. It, uh, it turns out that this is not his apartment. They're uh, they are, it's a, it's a sublet, everything. So they tell me how I can find him in the city at this point. So I, uh, find out where he's working. I go and I meet him and, and I said, why did you lie to me? And he said, well, if I had told you the truth, I don't think you ever would have made it to New York. So we went, we had breakfast. He got the village voice for me and he told me how to find a job in New York. And I went on a job search and he told me to go through and look for jobs where it said no experience necessary. I was fresh off the farm, right out of high school. I found a job my first day in New York as a messenger at 55 Water Street, $6 an hour uh, as a messenger. Uh, and so, uh, I came home that night. I was very excited that I had a job. And they said that I could stay there as long as I 
would follow a few rules in the house. And I basically became a house boy in the house. I would do the ironing and I would do the cleaning and I was doing all these things, uh, working myself to a frazzle. My first uh, audition in New York was a cattle call um, for Stardust Memories. Uh, that was on the 9th of August. Um, I came on August 5th, you may recall. Um, and at that audition, I met a, a, a wonderful woman at the time, or so I thought, uh, named Millie Brown. Uh, and she became like this anti-mame type of figure in my life. And she took me under her wings and she introduced me to so many wonderful things in New York. My first pastrami sandwich, my first uh, ride on the Staten Island Ferry, my first visit uh, to uh, uh, the Statue of Liberty, uh, going on my first uh, subway ride, doing all these incredible things uh, in New York. So uh, she was great to meet. And she was also uh, my first uh, confidant in New York, getting uh, to talk to her and uh, and to be able to have that sounding board uh, while I was in New York. So after being uh, in the apartment a few days, um, and again, I was this green kid uh, from South Carolina. I came home early one day uh, from uh, work. I got off work early. I came into the apartment uh, early. And there I found Brad and David doing what comes naturally. Then it dawned on me. Now I understood why Brad and David were glad that I was there. I wasn't interested. I wasn't ready. I didn't know. Everything. I knew why Lisa didn't want me. I knew why they did and everything. But um, I was there another week. And then I came home one day and they were going through uh, the one ads. They were looking for an apartment because, again, this was a, a, a sublet. They had to go. I thought they were looking for a place for all of us to go together. Not so. That was not the case. We had to get out. Um, and I said, where are we going? Lisa said, I don't know where you're going. We're going together. You're not going with us. But I was working again at 55 Water Street. I went to work the next day. I told everybody what I was going through. And someone at work, uh, his mom had just passed away. Uh, he was looking for a roommate. And that's where I went for the next few months. And I stayed there um, until I, uh, Millie, uh, this lady that I met at my first audition, uh, she uh, was looking for, uh, uh, she found an apartment uh, in her building uh, the following February, uh, shortly around the time of my birthday. I moved in in 1980 and I ended up living there for the next five years. Um, and then you know, over the course of the next few years, that was in the Bronx. Um, I moved around a lot over the next few years after that, for uh, first five years. Uh, different roommates, different situations. Um, but, you know, my acting career, I did a lot of acting. I did a lot of showcases. I did a lot of work on the road, uh, stock jobs, summer stock, got my equity card. Um, and then, you know, I spent 20 years performing as um, since it's at April Fool's Day. I'll share this with you. Um, a lot of you know this, April Fool's. Uh, I, I spent 20 years performing as Carol Channing. Uh, so there we are together, me and Carol. That's the first night that I performed uh, for Carol uh, when she met me uh, as Carol. So uh, that is really uh, how I made it to New York, folks. Um, the story and the show that I didn't expect to do today. But here we are. So if you've got any questions, comments, suggestions, anything, I'm here. So today the word is generosity. So uh, anyway, that's the story today. Lisa Rodrigo is here. And I think that on the 19th, uh, Lisa is going to interview me. Um, that is, if you're still interested in interviewing me. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's my story. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, questions, comments, suggestions, throw me a question about anything and I will go from there. Uh, so 
Uh, generosity, question. I can ask you a question. Let me pull a random question. Normally, I ask other people this question, but I'll ask myself a random question today. Um, if you could change one thing about the way you were raised, what would you change? <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer this. Um, I, unfortunately, uh, grew up, and uh, I'm going to put this on here uh, so that uh, I do want to give away, a, a giveaway today. So let's do this. Let's do a, a giveaway and let's uh, hide this. Uh, we'll hide that. Uh, let's see. Uh, hide that. So I want to show this and uh, we'll delete that. So um, I grew up in a... Um, in a house, uh, in a, an alcoholic household, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it took me years and years and years to realize that, uh, you know, the severity of that disease. Um, it robbed me of having a relationship with my father that I wish that I had had. Uh, it really. Uh, I, I didn't get the chance to know, uh, to really get to know my father uh, because uh, of this insidious disease. Um, I didn't think of it as a disease until I was much older. Um, and so, but I will say this, if I had come from a nurturing background, um, I don't think that I would have... Uh, stayed in New York. I don't think I could have survived in New York. But no matter how bad things got, I never felt that I ever wanted to go back. And so that propelled me to keep going forward. So interesting that that question popped up. That's the one thing that I would have changed. Um, what got me into celebrating everyone and interviewing? Uh, good question, Howard. Um, I started... Uh, I performed, as you know, as I mentioned, uh, performing as Carol Channing, uh, and I did that for 20 years. Um, unfortunately, and I can't really go into the details of this uh, because I signed a non-disclosure, uh, but my um, I signed a, a bad contract, uh, and I take responsibility for that. I take responsibility that I... I take responsibility for my actions. I signed a bad contract um, and didn't follow through. Uh, and uh, and that ended uh, the uh, uh, things I uh, changed. Uh, it changed the uh, trajectory of my career. And uh, so uh, Carol suggested, Carol Channing suggested that I start chronicling uh, the history of Dolly and women who had played Dolly. So I started writing about other women who had done Dolly. And that, um, and so I started writing a blog around the same time as well. And when I first started writing my blog, someone uh, suggested that I call this sh uh, my blog. Uh, I, I po posted on Facebook, said, what should I call the blog? And someone suggested Richard's Rants and Raves. And that was the initial name of my blog. And then someone said, you're always raving, but you're never ranting. And I don't want to rant uh, because um, I can do that privately. Uh, and I will do that privately, as some of you may know. Um, but I think there's too much of that out there. And um, I believe that with social media and reality television and what is it's too much of our culture. Uh, I want to celebrate. And I want to celebrate you. I want to celebrate other artists. Uh, and so I, someone said, you're always celebrating people. And that's how this came about. So thank you for asking that question, Howard. I really wanted to get out there and start celebrating each other. And that's uh, essentially how this all happened. 
Uh, so that's where it came from. Um, what would I tell a kid wanting to come to New York, Doug? Um, again, coming to New York in 1979, uh, I can't even imagine what it's like coming to New York now um, because of the cost. Um, I came to New York with $500 in my pocket. Um, $500 doesn't go very far now. Uh, so I don't even know how far that would go with anything. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, if, if you've got that desire and that dream, uh, don't ever let anyone try to tell you not to follow your dreams. Uh, dreams are meant to be followed. Uh, dreams are meant to be manifested. Uh, dreams are meant to be realized. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm reading this great book now um, called uh, The 5 uh, a.m. Club. And I was reading this morning and it said that, you know, I, I believe that all of us, uh, people are too quick to say, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Uh, don't do that. It's like the Stephen Sondheim song. Everybody says don't. Everybody says don't. Everybody says don't. And everybody's got a, a quick way of saying, you know, it shouldn't happen. Um, you know, not to follow through with things. Um I do what I do. I try to stay in my lane. I hope that people are going to show up. Uh, I appreciate it when you do show up. Uh, I hope that you like what I do. I hope that you will go out and tell other people about what I do. Um, that's all I can do. That's all I can hope for. Um, so just keep doing it. Um, uh, I'll have to tell you uh, my eldest son's story offline. Uh, Doug, I'd love to hear it. Um, is there any role you regret taking or regret turning down? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't regret Tasha, call me, uh, and I'll tell you, um, No, no, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no, because um, I've learned from every decision I've made. So, uh, I, I no, I, I, I do not regret any choice that I've ever made, because every time that I've made a choice, I've learned from it. Um, I believe that every single day, there are choices that we make um, with every single decision. Uh, whether we say yes, whether we say no, um, every email I get, uh, every uh, person who shows up here, uh, you know, everything is, is a choice. And uh, we're going to constantly learn. And uh, right now, I'm going to give away, uh, I'm going to give away something right now. So let's see who's going to be our winner. And I'm going to go back here. And uh, let me do this on screen. Um, so Francis, Francis, I love you, Francis, show up, show up, show up. Uh, and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to, um, uh, we're going to be uh, generous. Uh, Francis, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, my phones are turned off right now. Uh, Francis, uh, give me a call in about 25 minutes and, uh, uh, we're going to, I'm going to do something very generous for you. That's going to be my generous uh, offer to you. So give me a call, uh, Francis, okay? Um, I want to thank you all for showing up today. Uh, again, uh, it means so lot, uh, much to me. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, after this show today, with all of you, I want you all to go to your Facebook friends list. I always say this. And today, let's say um, it's April Fool's Day, no fooling. Uh, the first name that you see when you go to your Facebook friends list, reach out with a phone call and let that person know that they, they, they mean something to you, that you love them and you know, that they mean something. Um, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you know, if you go out in the boat, uh, you bring a skipper along and Francis, I hope that sometime this summer 
that we find ourselves on a boat somewhere together on some cruise or something. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, in the top of your shows for me, I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you better. Thank you. I didn't expect this show to turn out the way it uh, did today, but um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this means a lot. And um, Ron, I hope to see you a little later. Uh, Francis, call me in about half an hour. I'll see you all later. Everybody have a great evening and uh, go out and do something nice uh, for somebody else ex without expecting anything in return. I love you. Thank you. Goodbye.